Hi, everyone. We've just started recording our APAD talk, but we're going to give one more minute until we actually officially start. So please just settle in and we'll start in a moment. All right, well, I'm going to get started now. I think we're a few seconds away from the actual hour, but I think we can get going. So um, hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. My name is Andra Russick from Scheinbaum and Russick Gallery. I am a member of the APAD Education Committee and a presenter today of this APAD Talk. I want to just remind all of you that next week we'll be having our APAD Photography Show in New York. So if you're in the area, please come and visit. Uh, there'll be an amazing array of dealers and photog photographs for you to see. Uh, this talk is going to be recorded and it will be available on the APAD website where you can also find previous talks from the last year, two years. APAD Talks brings together prominent curators, artists, collectors, and writers to discuss thought-provoking ideas, new trends, and unique processes involved in the medium of photography. APAD Talk starts conversations that lead to understanding, inspiration, and action. Our speaker today is Dr. Patrick Lenigan, head of the Department of Prints and Photographs and Sculpture at the Historic Hispanic Society of America in New York. Dr. Lenigan will be speaking about the photography collection at the Society. Uh, Patrick Lenigan received his BA from Columbia University and his PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU, and has been at the Hispanic Society of America since 1995. In his exhibitions and publications on photography, he has examined how images of Spain and Latin America were created in the 19th and 20th centuries, and now provide a chronicle of a way of life almost lost. He has organized numerous exhibitions on prints and photographs. And he has also written extensively on Spanish Renaissance and Baroque sculpture. We look forward to an exciting and informative talk today. At the end of the discussion, we'll have a Q&A. So please, if you have any questions, add them to the Q&A section on your Zoom and I will read them off and we'll try to get a nice discussion going when we're done. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Pat Patrick Lenigan. Well, thank you so much, Andra, for that uh, kind introduction. Thank you to APAD for the invitation to speak here about the Hispanic Society's photography collection, which I'm really uh, thrilled at the chance to um, let you all know about it. And let me start with, get my presentation up. All right. So the Hispanic Society is uh, founded in 1904 and located in Upper Manhattan. It's a museum and library devoted to the culture of Spain and Latin America. Although unfortunately it's currently closed, many know its impressive art collection. Fewer, however, are aware of its photography collection, which holds over 178,000 photographs. And today I would like to offer an introduction to some of its treasures. In particular, the work of five photographers. As we do this, I also hope to give you an idea of what makes it such a special collection. Because it was designed to be an encyclopedic record of all aspects of Spain and Latin America, it includes images of paintings, sculptures, and decorative arts. But it is the images of cities, countrysides, and how people lived that set it apart. So the five photographers begin with Ruth Anderson. Early in 1928, an American woman, Ruth Matilda Anderson, set up her camera in Placentia on an empty street then called the Calle de la Corredera, and took a picture. As she did this, two men rode down, passing by a building with a sign saying Fiat. Today, the photograph has a certain charm for the contrast between the riders and the advertised, if absent, cars. Anderson, however, had taken the photograph to document the street, and in particular, one of its buildings, the Parador de San Juan, that faces onto it. She went on to make six images of the building, recording it thoroughly. 
the first photograph, the one I showed you, appealed so much to me that I included it in an exhibition we organized in Badajoz in 2004. And before that, when I visited Placentia, I attempted to find the street and the building, but I failed. What I did not know was that these pictures formed part of a chapter of the city's history. The Parador de San Juan had burned down five years after Anderson's visit in a dramatic fire. You see, it got a full page coverage in the newspaper. The family that owned it moved across the street and their descendants grew up playing in its ruins and looking for pictures of the building. In the 1960s, the city rebuilt and renamed the street, which made it impossible for me to recognize. And this is what it looks like today. So you can see why I couldn't find it. During these years, the owners continued their fruitless search for photos, only to find them at last in the exhibition of 2004. Their surprise and joy came through in the email they sent me after they visited our exhibition. Thus, the only record of this part of Placentia's urban history is found today in New York City. That such a photo exists in the Hispanic society and how it came to be there reflects the history of the Hispanic society and the talent of the photographer, Ruth Anderson. In particular, it points out both the appeal and significance of the collection of photographs at the Hispanic Society. No single photographer better embodies the museum's goals than Anderson. Yet in doing this, she was following explicit directives from the museum's founder, Archer Milton Huntington. Huntington knew the major cities of his time and spent extended periods in Madrid and Seville. Yet he believed the real Spain existed outside of its urban centers. And here you can see him traveling. In fact, he developed a profound admiration for the rural regions which he visited. For him, they evinced a genuine image that differed sharply from that formed by most tourists who saw only the sentimentalized or cliched features of the country. In keeping with his far reaching vision of the Hispanic society, Huntington determined that it would include a photographic archive of Spanish customs as well as art. In Anderson, he found someone who would execute this with an astounding eye and dogged tenacity. Born in Nebraska, she received her first instruction in photography from her father, Alfred Theodore Anderson, who ran a studio in Kearney, specializing in views and portraits. After going to college in Nebraska, Anderson moved to New York City, where she attended the Clarence H. White School for Photography, from which she received a diploma in 1990. This center occupies an important place in the history of American photography. Two years after Anderson graduated from White School, the Hispanic Society of America hired her. She'd been working as an interior decorator when the secretary from the school called her to tell her that the Hispanic Society was looking for a photographer and Clarence White had recommended her. The museum immediately impressed her with its vision and daring as it seemed to capture the spirit of Spain. No less imposing was the man who guided it. As she recalled the first interview, Archer Huntington was tall with quote, amused but keen eyes. He demanded excellence and hard work while admitting that it was all something of an experiment. Apparently she satisfied him because he wondered if she could start work the next day. Instead, they agreed she would begin the following week. When Anderson entered the Hispanic Society, it had been operating for more than a decade, yet it was still in its formative years. She particularly relished the opportunity to learn from Huntington. At the outset, she worked as the museum photographer, though Huntington shortly promoted her to curator of photography in 1922 when he added more staff. Then in 1923, she traveled to Spain for the first time to take pictures for the museum. In the following years, she would make four further ex photographic expeditions in which she visited various regions of the country, some quite remote. On the first of these trips, Anderson's father accompanied her, supplying much needed field experience. But subsequently, another Hispanic society photographer, Francis Spaulding, traveled with her. When in 1930, Anderson returned from the last of these, her career at the museum shifted yet again. Instead of overseeing photography, she now focused on the study of Spanish costume and published several books and articles on the subject. Finally, in 1954, she was named curator of costume at the Hispanic Society, a post which she held until her retirement almost 30 years later. Throughout her professional life, these trips and photographs played an important role. 
Not only had she acquired vital firsthand experience, but the images fur furnished essential primary material for her research. As important as her research in costume is today, however, we must recognize the appeal of her photographs. During her career, Anderson extensively chronicled several regions, Galicia, Asturias, Leon and here Extremadura, as well as, the, as well as the Canary Islands. In fact, these pictures account for, pictures of these regions account for almost 80% of her output, which she eventually numbered more than 14,000 negatives. She also made shorter campaigns in Western Andalusia, Morocco, Portugal, the Azores and Brazil. The last of these happened in 1948. In her photographs, Anderson recorded a timeless Spain found principally in small towns and rural regions. There she concentrated on old buildings, local industries, and uh, the community's public life, and festivals uh, or religious rites. Significantly, she limited herself to those aspects of the individual's life carried out in public, such as collecting, oh, there's another one of the um, uh, uh, public of a play, collecting water at a well, whitewashing a house, or the exercise of a profession. Stylistically, her pictures present these daily events with a straightforward tranquility, while also suggesting an effortless naturalism. Along the way, however, many of these images, which she made to record a trade or costume, have almost taken on a life of their own to become portraits in their own right. Although taken to record a little girl carrying a metal milk can, the picture almost captures the spirit of an era. In another case, Anderson's shot of women and girls heading off to market now um, seems to have uh, a, a, it's an evocation of their indomitable spirit, carving out a livelihood in a formidable setting. In Extremadura, Anderson was documenting all aspects of the pig trade, so she went out to the fields. While she was photographing a swine herd for his costume, she, re, she uh, recorded striking portraits of father and son. And that one, this is one of my favorite of her photos because the expression with which the little boy looks up at the father is just wonderful. Her painstaking approach is what made all this possible. She approached her subjects respectfully, asking them what they were doing and writing down their response. In return, they gladly left off what they were doing to talk to her and in the process they relaxed so that she captured these images of remarkable spontaneity. Perhaps this is nowhere more apparent than in Monte Hermoso, Extremadura, which is the Western part of Spain that borders Portugal. Anderson visited this woman, Maxima Hernandez, a local artisan who made the, pro, the prized straw hats of the town. This was a notable part of local costume that she was interested in documenting. Anderson, who had first seen such headgear in Soroya's painting, understood the importance of this article. So she sought out Doña Maxima and the hat maker, so that the hat maker could explain her craft. And as Doña Maxima relaxed and talked while working, Anderson made these remarkable images of a self-confident woman plying her trade. Throughout it all, Anderson ventured into some remote regions, but even so, perhaps the trip she and her father made on November 5th through 7th of 1924, from Muros to Finisterre stands out for its difficulties. And here you can see the, the trip they're undertaking uh, courtesy of Google Maps. The goal was the lighthouse on the point once thought to be the end of the world. And once Anderson arrived, she took some spectacular shots. Still, getting there was quite an adventure. Today, one can drive this distance in little over an hour, but for Anderson, it took uh, two days with stops at Pindo and Thé, which uh, you can see the pointer, it's there and it's there. From Muros, one could only reach Pindo on foot or by horse. So they hired a guide, his boy, and two horses. As they set off with two horses, Anderson's father rode one while the other carried their luggage. When they came to the tidelands, they crossed at low tide. Yet at one point there was a stream that rose to their knees. There Ruth rode with the luggage while the boy 
while the man set his boy behind Anderson's father. Although the horses slipped in the water, the only casualty was their tripod, which Anderson's father fixed that evening in the hotel at Pindo. From there, they headed on to Fay, hiring two women to carry their luggage on their heads as they proceeded to a ferry. In fact, the advantages of having one own car were so great that Anderson and her father contemplated buying one of their own. Although she didn't do so on this trip, the Hispanic Society later bought her one, which they reconfigured for their purposes. So you can see it starts off in this and ends up like that. It became the body of a Fiat, the battery of a Chevrolet, and the chassis of a Ford. Anderson and her uh, fellow photographer Spalding affectionately called it Nuestra Señora de la Purísima Concepción, or Nuestra Señora for short. That's Our Lady of the Pure of the Immaculate Conception. But it provided them invaluable service as Anderson traveled more easily through the remote parts of Spain. Admittedly, some places remained so remote that even for their car, at which point they returned to mules. You can see how they use the back of the car there to store their pho photographic equipment. And you can see as she's gotten, they've stopped the car and she's walking on to reconnoiter. So I have to say that on a personal level, one of the great pleasures in my 27 years at the Hispanic Society has been making these remarkable photographs and the story of Ruth Anderson better known through exhibitions and catalogs. We've done major exhibitions, as you can see here in Extremadura in 2004. Another one in Galicia in 2009. And then in Asturias in 2018. But one of the interesting things about this in Galicia was that in Asturias rather, is that they juxtaposed the items that she photographed with the real life objects and it brought, I think, to life the artistry in her shots by this juxtaposition, because you could see that they were daily items, but they're somehow transformed in the photographs. I'm happy to say that we're no means finished and more exhibition and articles are yet to come. Even so, I think we have succeeded in making her work known in Spain. Scholars today agree that if you want to know what Galicia or Extremadura were like in the 1920s, you can't do any better than to start with their work. And this is uh, one of these images that I think captures both the, uh, the timelessness and the moment of daily life. And it's a way of life that is forever gone. And it's her artistry and her skill that makes it so vivid as an evocation and so powerful. So if Anderson faced challenging obstacles in her travels through Spain, the next figure I would like to show, Charles Clifford, a uh, English photographer of the 19th century, perhaps confronted even more daunting ones as he journeyed throughout the peninsula. Photographer of great energy and resourcefulness, he created an extensive corpus of images of Spain in the 1850s and the early 1860s. Shortly after his arrival in Madrid, Clifford opened a portrait studio where he made daguerreotypes while also serving as an instructor of photography and a balloonist. By 1853, he was producing calotypes but two years later, he had switched to wet collodion and glass plates. And you can see from these that he too is not averse to traveling far afield. Basing himself in Spain, he established contacts with Queen Isabel II and her brother-in-law, the Duke of Montpensier. The Duke of Montpensier is a fascinating character. Based in Seville, he was an avid photography collector and he went on to become an important patron of Clifford's. The photographer maintained ties with the English and French photographic societies where he exhibited some of the works he had taken as he traveled throughout Spain. As he recounts it, it was an arduous undertaking. In his words, quote, the difficulties of a photographer are not a few while traveling in a country where the temperatures of trans, where the conveniences of transport are unknown and where the temperature ranges in midday from 90 degrees to 110 and not less than 80 degrees in the shade where distilled water is about as likely to be met with as in the Sahara Desert, and where owing to the extreme dryness of the soil, dust is the absolute rule. He also describes the particular challenges a photographer faced. Because of course, he's got to carry everything with him. He says, quote, all this paraphernalia balanced and strapped on the backs of mules and our worthy selves in a similar fixing, minus the strapping, 
We start at 4 a.m. on our day's expedition, a continued nervous excitement being kept up by each sway and stumble of these long-eared animals, threatening destruction to our brittle pans, glasses, and bottles. The pace by its rapidity is certainly not killing, on an average, about three miles an hour. But Clifford thrived on the challenges and succeeded in recording some of the earliest shots of the monuments and cities he visited. The Hispanic Society is lucky enough to hold seven albums with his work. Of these, I want to look at the last one he made, the album de Andalucía y Murcia, which chronicles Isabel II's visit to these regions in September and October of 1862. A stunning volume of 93 photographs, it is a milestone in Spanish photography and arguably his masterpiece. The Queen commissioned 30 sets of this volume as part of a campaign of luxury propaganda. The copy held today at the Hispanic Society of America originally belonged to the Queen's sister and brother-in-law, the Duke and Duchess of Montpensier. The album consists of a range of shots from cityscapes, cathedrals, churches, and monuments, and perhaps most strikingly, the ephemeral architecture erected in honor of the Queen as they stopped in each city. Throughout, Clifford displays a sure eye and mastery of technique creating images with a rich tonal range and sharp focus. His achievement becomes even more impressive when one considers the difficult conditions under which he, like so many of the time, worked. He had bulky equipment, fragile glass negatives, and a portable darkroom. Consequently, the logistics forced him to organize any expedition carefully in advance. As a whole, the album amply testifies to Clifford's artistry and throws light not only on the Queen's visit, but also on the early history of photography in Spain. Clifford's professional interest was to record, quote, subjects historically interesting and such as may serve as mementos of an epoch when this naturally favored kingdom swayed the destinies of nearly all the then discovered world, close quote. Once we understand this, his powerful images of Spain's rich architectural heritage take on more meaning, not just in this album, but in his entire career. These are, all, these are two photos that are not in the album, but you, you imagine the, the difficulty he had to get up on the roof of the Salamanca Cathedral to take the photograph on the left, or that, that he focused on this tower in, um, on the right in Salamanca. That's, that's a photographer who's, who's actively looking for architectural monuments as part of a historical vision. The album de Andalucía, however, played a role in contemporary politics as well as seen in the shots of the ephemeral structures and triumphal arches. While they may seem incongruous today, they reveal the agenda behind the album. Isabel II's visit to the region was one of many that she made throughout the peninsula as part of a propaganda campaign from 1858 to 66, by which the court sought to bolster the queen's popularity. And I should say that this is the last one of a series that Clifford makes of albums for her as she travels through different parts of uh, Spain. At this point, the monarchy seemed shaky, particularly after a revolution of 1854, which had almost toppled her. Consequently, the government looked for ways to secure the regime and the system of constitutional monarchy in general. Although the queen had come to embody much that was distasteful to the ruling classes and the army, she still enjoyed a certain popularity with the masses. Thus, the government attempted to capitalize on this appeal through the trips that the queen and her family made throughout the nation. The trips were thus designed as showcases for a traditional monarchy in a modern world. The court organized them carefully to present the queen in the most flattering light, particularly since she would distribute large charitable donations at each stop. So this context, I think, is important when we look at the album because these images are not just odd things tossed in. They're a part of the whole structure of the album. And it shows us Clifford working within the agenda set for him by the court, but also within his own uh, desires as a photographer for what he wanted to complete. And if you think that there are 93 photographs and there are 30 sets of these produced, this is a formidable undertaking because that gives you about 2,700 prints he's got to make in total. And to maintain this level of quality throughout it is a really remarkable achievement. 
With these images by Anderson and Clifford, I have shared a few of the treasures of the Hispanic Society's collection from Spain. As I said at the outset, we also have images from Latin America as visitors who saw the small exhibition that we held at the winter show here in New York City in 2020 would have seen. There we featured two photographs of Mapuche Indians by Odber Heffer, which date from his time among these distinctive people. Heffer was in many ways a, a figure who embodies a lot of what uh, the history of photography in Latin America involves. He was a Canadian who emigrated to Chile in 1887, where he went on to become one of the great photographers of his day. He began working for a French photographer already established there, Félix Leblanc, who had branches in Santiago and Valparaíso. By 1896, Heffer had taken over the studio in Santiago and embarked on the career which would make him a preeminent photographer in Chile. And in fact, he went on to establish a photographic shop there, which uh, boasted by the time of his death and his son taking it over, one of the largest uh, sales of photographic material. Over the course of his career, he depicted a wide range of subjects as seen in the various albums and individual photographs in our collection. The photo of the Mapuche comes from an album that an anonymous Frenchman, to judge by the titles written on the back, had assembled. And in this album, he, there are 46 of Heffer's pictures, probably taken between 1890 and 95. These images offer an interesting anthology of Chile. It begins with uh, urban scenes of urban life in Santiago. It moves on to Valparaíso. And there are also images of uh, horsemen before it moves on to images of the mountains, the Cordillera, and in general, the country in the south, where we conclude with a section dealing with the Mapuche Indians. So this shot, which has this couple standing confidently and proudly before the photographer is part of a bigger section. And the, uh, the photos in the album represent only a small portion of Heffer's work among these people. He was always an intrepid photographer. He traveled throughout the nation. He ventured into the Mapuche's lands as well. And that's no mean feat. The Mapuche, known as Araucanas to the Spanish conquistadors, had successfully repelled all efforts at conquest in the colonial era. Eventually, the colonial authorities in the 18th century came to accept the autonomy of the Indians in their territory. When Chile and Argentina declared their independence from Spain in the 19th century, however, the new republics took a different view with local press and official debates often advocating the subjugation of these tribes as part of a jingoist and expansionist agenda. The Mapuche proved so resilient that the Chilean government only achieved this goal in 1883, that's 60 some years after the declared independence from Spain, when they finally pushed the Indians onto reservations. Throughout it, all, the Mapuche de demonstrated extraordinary character and resourcefulness, alternately cooperating with authorities and alternately resorting to armed resistance. Consequently, Heffer's photographs, which may date as early as circa 1890, would have sparked great interest in both national and international circles, because this is just the moment when they're in the news for all these reasons. Drawing on his considerable talents with portrait, and his love of traveling to uh, far off and adventurous territories, he's captured a sequence of impressive figures who stand proudly before the camera. With uh, the time left, I would like to discuss uh, two photographers and the photographs of Machu Picchu in Peru. Although the Hispanic Society does not focus on pre-Columbian civilizations of Latin America, we hold some remarkable photographs of this site, which offer a glimpse of the spectacular monument, while also telling us about the history of photography and our collection. Machu Picchu is today emblematic of the Inca civilization, but this was not always the case. While the locals had never forgotten its existence, it only attained international attention when an American explorer, Hiram Bingham, 
first saw it in 1911 and publicized it. Uh, Hiram Bingham is another one of these uh, fascinating characters. Through uh, his life was notable in his time. He was an explorer, then a aviator, and then a politician, a senator for Connecticut. And he seems, his life story seems to have been via a movie, the inspiration for the figure of Indiana Jones. As a uh, explorer and archeologist, he made a number of exhibitions with the support of Yale, where he was also a professor, and the National Geographic, which published his articles. He was intrepid in finding publicity and backing, and he found backers among American companies and the Hispanic Society's Archer Huntington, so that we have acquired a set of the photographs that Bingham took directly from him. He also got the support of uh, Kodak and uh, rifle companies, and he was really a very effective at hawking himself. Photography fe figured importantly in his project. He got sponsorship from Kodak and instructed the members of the exhibition how to use the camera and what to record. Because Bingham was meticulous, if not obsessive, in recording the details of each shot, the, pic the pictures have exemplary supporting documentation, which makes them invaluable for modern research. But one has to remember that Bingham and his team took these pictures to document an archaeological expedition, even if their concept of archaeology is not uh, consistent with modern standards for field work. Nonetheless, his enthusiasm for the site and Inca ruins comes through in countless shots. That was a panorama and here's another panorama. He had a special camera whose technique he mastered and he uh, didn't entrust it to anyone but himself. This shot and others show how the ruins nestle in their setting as well as just how overgrown it was when he came upon it in 1911. When Bingham continued on to other Inca sites, he found the monumental impressive ceremonial rock of Musta Hispana, just beyond Vilcabamba. Here too, he first had to clear the site as you can see in this photo. It again presented a challenge because the rock was so large that it's uh, very hard to get a single photo that really captures it. So he did what most photographers would do. He's got photographs from all sides and then he's got details as well. And in the process of taking these shots, how he frames them, how he composes them are often very, very effective. But at the same time, once you know that it's an archeological uh, approach that's driving these photographs, you can understand better, I think, why his photos have the look that they do. And in fact, a different approach appears in a set of seven photographs of Mar Machu Picchu at the Hispanic Society taken by Martin Chambi. Today, Chambi is recognized as a splendid photographer with a breathtaking technique and vision, but he didn't always enjoy such a reputation. For most of his life, he worked as one of a number of local photographers in Cusco, recording the Inca heritage, which fascinated him. While he was working in this capacity, a German-born musicologist, Irma Goebel, visited Cusco in the late 1920s where she acquired these pictures. After her death in 1982, her daughter bequeathed her collection of 178 photographs of Latin America to the Hispanic Society, including these by Chambi. When the staff cataloged the photographs, they duly identified the photographer, but they didn't recognize his importance since the movement to appreciate him was only beginning to gain traction. A remarkable figure and a Quechua Indian he learned photography from local figures and went on to pursue a successful career in Cusco, a city not that far from Machu Picchu, which he would record over the course of his life. These photographs show a masterful sense of composition. In this photo, he shoots directly into the sun, yet captures the majesty and mystery of the site. In another, he focuses on a feature used in sacred rites, but juxtaposes it with the setting evocatively. Chambi's work differs from that of Bingham, in part because he understood the site differently and wanted to capture different effects. It also differs because he's brought uh, a different camera. He's working with larger glass plates. And since he's not coming as far or staying as long, he's not facing the same problem Bingham had, which was that he had to bring, Bingham had to bring massive quantities of film 
and keep them with him at all times. Chambi could do this in a day trip or a, a more limited experience. I mean, anyone who climbs up Machu Picchu has to climb up a very tall mountain and that's a serious logistical problem. But if you're only staying for a limited time, you can bring a, a bigger camera. And Chambi spent time learning the site, patiently working and getting his technique uh, more and more precise so that his photos, I think, reflect his experience and his extended stay, and they have a, a power and an intimacy to them. And I think once we understand the difference of their approach, their technique, it explains the photos better. And in fact, the work of the three photographers of South America that we've looked at in this flying survey, Heffer, Bingham, and Chambi, just as like those of Anderson and Clifford, fit well within the vision that Huntington established for the Hispanic Society's photography collection to form a record of what these places looked like and how people lived. The consistency with which Huntington and his staff pursued this goal stands out even more when we consider the different ways in which the works entered the collection by purchase, in the case of some of them, donation, is the case of these photos by Chambi, or the expeditions which the institution subsidized like Bingham's or in the case of Anderson's, not just subsidized, but directly defined. But at the same time, all of these photographers, the five we've looked at today, take us to the heart of many questions concerning photography. Their remarkable images result from the vision and determination as they made these arduous trips in search of their subjects. How they reacted when they reached their destination reflects their training, skill, and intentions. In the first place, they had to decide what kind of camera and supplies to bring, frequently over great distances. Then they had to respond to the situation as it unfolded. The differences between them reveal much about each as a photographer and how they understood the medium. As we look at their work, we need to keep these considerations in mind as we admire their achievements. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you so much. That was so informative, learned a lot. Uh, some photographers I hadn't heard of before, so it was really wonderful. Um, everyone, thank you for listening. We're gonna jump right in with some questions right now. Uh, there's one question in the Q&A and please, if you have any more questions, add them to the Q&A and we'll read them off. Um, I'm gonna read them. The first question is, um, are there any daguerreotypes from Argentina and Uruguay in your collection? Alas, no, but we do have some really interesting material from Argentina and Uruguay. Um, starting with Uruguay, because it's a little easier, we have a mammoth prints of uh, Montevideo by Schutten Brooks. And we have uh, an album which seems to be the album of uh, proofs that the photographer would show clients because it's labeled muestras, which, must, which means proofs of a photographer from the late 1880s and 90s, Luis Pastorino. For Argentina, uh, we, have, um, we have some very interesting things. We have uh, photographs of, one of the early things that drives photography is the railways. And railways come to Argentina a little bit later for economic and historical reasons. But there's a railroad built from uh, Tucumán to, uh, from Rosario to Tucumán, which is built by, Ita by, of all crazy things, an Italian engineer. And he hired an Italian photographer, Stecca, who took uh, the photographs of this extension. So we have photographs of the engines, the um, stations, and the surrounding landscape. So we, we, have, um, we have that of Argentina too. We also have some of the photographs by uh, the uh, early uh, established houses of photo photographers in Argentina, Moody and uh, Boot. So I don't have the daguerreotypes, but I have the others. <laughs> we have the others. And do you have other uh, daguerreotypes? Do you have daguerreotypes or cased images in the collection? Yes, we do. Um, the daguerreotypes, however, are from the Philippines. Um, they are. Actually, if you go to Toronto between June 10th and early October, 
you can see them at the Art Gallery of Ontario in an exhibition. Uh, they probably date from the 1840s and they're probably taken by a French man who was traveling to the Philippines. Uh, this is a subject that uh, my colleague, Noemi Espinosa has done a lot of research on and I'm hoping that the article in which she publishes this will come out soon. Well, and that leads me to another question is, what kind of exhibitions do you have coming up that people can visit to see some of these works? Well, um, they have to get on a plane and go to Spain, which I'm sure is a great hardship for everyone. Uh, if, if you go to Pontevedra in Galicia, which is in the northwest part of Spain, opening in August is an exhibition, which I think is going to be very, very interesting. They're going to take um, a, a local association uh, devoted to the recreation of regional costume, looked at Anderson's photographs and said, my God, this is an invaluable resource as we try to figure out how to make these costumes. So they're going to, they're going to put the recreations that they've made of these costumes from the 20s on display with the photographs. And the, the design I've seen for this looks very appealing. It's going to, I think, uh, show the photographs in a new light. It's, and it's going to be very interesting because I hope that it's going to go directly to the reason that Anderson made these, which was she wanted to document costume. And I think she'd be tickled that uh, she's done such an excellent job at this, that the photographs have now enabled people to reconstruct these costumes. And the images, as I hope I've shown you, have such a powerful appeal that I think the whole effect is going to be a very evocative one and it should be a strong show. The second exhibition also opening in Spain will open in the town of Zamora, which is also in the Northwest part of Spain. Um, and it's gonna focus on Anderson's photographs of Zamora that she took in 1926. And I think those photos have never been published before. I've been wanting to do an exhibition of this material for a long time since I first saw them. I mean, I showed one picture of a religious play uh, that was in a different area, but Anderson went to Zamora and its regions, and she documented Holy Week, a religious play they put on, uh, scenes of the area. And I think it's going to be a very, that too will be a very strong show with images that show her ability to document things in a way that they transcend the document or it becomes even more effective as a document because they're so strong as images and they have such power. Excellent. Um, they both sound very interesting. I'm sorry, I can't get on a plane right now. Um, <laughs> you have a few months still. Um, <laughs> the next question I have is, have you published any of Heifer's work? Yes, we did. Um, the, from 27, in 2017, 2018, 2019, we did a three volume set of our photographs of Latin America sort of from South America up through Central America. Each volume had a thematic focus. The first volume focused on cityscapes. The second volume focused on scenes of industry. The third focused on landscape ruins and um, sort of other images that had kind of escaped us. And as we did this, we combed the archive of the various regions. And once we came to Chile, it was sort of hard to escape the, uh, these images by Heffer, which are really so, so powerful. And so they are, they're included in these three volumes, which um, are titled Visiones de Latino America. And um, yes. So and can we, we find uh, those on your, on the website? Yes. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then speaking of the website, the next question that we have is, are the works in the collection digitized? Alas, that is a yes and a no. Um, they are digitized. As we, we had a survey of the photography collection done in 2007 uh, through the ARP program at the Eastman House. And they pointed out several issues that needed addressing. And we've addressed those. One of them was the, um, our, our, our negatives, which I knew. And so most of Anderson's negatives are digitized and we digitize new acquisitions as they come in. And I digitize uh, material as we need it for different projects. So the collection 
is being digitized. I am the photographer digitizing it because in addition to the titles that you gave at the beginning, I've also become the photographer for my department and also for uh, my colleagues as well. So it does, that limits how much we can do. And the next question I'm sure which is behind this is, can I go to the website and see them? And there we come to a bottleneck between what we have digitized and what is on our website, which I fervently hope one day will be resolved and you will be able to go to the website and see them. This is something we really, really want, but we are, um, we are fortunate and blessed with the collection, which is so extensive. We are not similarly blessed with our staff. There are fewer of us than should be. Yes, yes, understandably, that seems to be often the case right now. Oh, um, uh, yes. Yeah. So speaking of the collection and digitizing, uh, is the collection growing now? And are you focused more on the 19th century or are you also bringing in works from 20th century, more contemporary artists, things of that nature? That's, a, that's an easy question and a hard question. The easy part is that yes, the collection is still growing. And uh, a friend of mine, when I started, pointed out to me, he said, Patrick, everything you add is always gonna create two gaps on either side of it that you're gonna need to fill. And I am keenly aware of that. So we look to build on the strengths. And at the same time, we are happy to uh, receive gifts that take us um, a little bit further afield. We've been buying actively and as things appear, we've, we've made significant additions in late 19th century, mid 19th century photographs of Mexico and Latin America. Uh, we've also added uh, photographs from that same time period in Spain. We also got uh, two really splendid donations that were more recent. Uh, one was a photographer who recently died, who lived in Upper Manhattan named Ralph Weiss, who, to judge by what I've seen, he had a phenomenal technique and he was obsessive about it. He went to Mexico in the late 50s and early 60s and his images uh, fit perfectly with our collection because they show, he traveled not just in Mexico City, he went outside and he took pictures of what he saw, what appealed to him, people uh, in daily life, photographs of details he saw in churches, and they really complement beautifully photographs in our collection. So it was a donation that I was thrilled to receive. And in our long-term plans, you mentioned exhibitions. I'm really hoping that uh, we do get a chance to exhibit some of them because I think it would be good for De demonstrating what the collection is. And also there is this connection to the Upper uh, West Side in Manhattan. The second donation that we received is uh, a photographer who was uh, interested in, um, he worked in, public, in PR and he was also in the Air Force and he was stationed in Spain in the late 60s and early 70s named Gary Beals. And he has an incredible eye and technique and he traveled, he was, very enthusiastic about Spain and he traveled in this strange moment in Spain's history when it's at the end of the Franco era and he saw some things that and he recorded them that in the sort of spirit of Anderson uh, the Spaniards I don't think would have taken them and they, they stand out and they're strong images and I think there's also material there that I'm hoping to uh, do an exhibition of and I have uh, ideas that way too, but again, there are no dates planned. So uh, this is a sense of how we grow. We have to grow consistent with what we are, but expanding outwards. So we are growing and we are planning and we are trying with the resources we have to uh, make the collection better known. And I think we, we have one more question here. Uh, and if anyone else has a question, please write it in because we're gonna to start to wrap up. But the last question is curious, could you discuss the relationship between the Lane Collection and the Hispanic Society? And actually it's a two part question. Are there any Tina Modati photographs of Mexico, revolutionary portraits, archeological sites, et cetera? Well, no, we don't. All right, there, that's, 
The first part is no, we do not have Tina Modati photos and Huntington deliberately avoided uh, political and contemporary. This is, um, it was, his, his interest was what he thought was timeless, how people lived, not in the political tumult and uh, revolutions. And uh, we have the same problem with the Civil War in Spain. This, uh, these photographs of Anderson are a wonderful record of the Spain that existed and that was torn apart by the Spanish Civil War. But Huntington found himself in Spain with friends on both sides of the divide. And he didn't buy any art coming out of Spain. In general, he wanted no paintings out of Spain, but he put the brakes on any acquisitions coming out of Spain during the Civil War because so much was in flux and he didn't want to be buying something that um, the ownership was unclear, contested, or had been seized. So there were a number of reasons. It wasn't just simply the, the agenda of the collection in a broader way. It was also a respect for uh, who, of not trying to be sort of profiting off the war, that he, he just sort of drew back from that. And we're sort of now in a position that uh, these photos will not only will sit sort of out of place in the collection, but it would also be in some ways too late to start trying to, to collect them. And it's, it's, um, it's an interesting question because a lot of times, this is not the first time I've been asked about the Mexican Revolution or the Spanish Civil War. I, it wasn't actually in the question, but it came, it came to mind for the same reasons. So um, yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. And it's um, the reason why not it's disappointing that I can't tell you we have them, but the reason why not goes to the heart, I think, of who we are as a collection and what we are as an institution. Excellent. And, and then the, the, the next part of that question is discussing the relationship between the Lane Collection and the Hispanic Society, if there is well, one. Uh, I'm afraid I don't think there is one. Uh, okay. the... Well, I think, I think that's all the questions we have. And I just want to thank you again. Um, it was a great talk to listen to and to see the images. And it's been a wonderful hour for me. And I hope everyone else enjoyed it. And I thank you all for joining us um, today for this APAD talk. And again, I'm just going to leave it that these are all recorded. And you can watch them again on the APAD website. You can watch them on our YouTube page. I hope that you will all take the time if you are in or around New York to visit the APAD photography show next week and look for the next upcoming talks. We have a few more coming up and I think they're all gonna be great. And so Patrick, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, my pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Great. And I think, um, so are you going to be able to go to the uh, the oh, I definitely photography show. I definitely want to. I Good. my 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 overlords have inconsiderately put meetings on Thursday and Friday, so I'm trying to figure out how I carve out the time. But I definitely want to go. Okay. Good. Well, hopefully you'll get to go and you'll run into some of the people that have been at this talk. Now they'll all recognize you, so <laughs> you're going to be somewhat of a celebrity when you go. Now oh, that will be a that will be an interesting and novel experience. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so, and people are saying goodbye and we'll, we'll say goodbye. And I think the recording is going to stop and um, thank you all again for joining us. It's